not gonna come. I am excited to be here. And I do want to express my appreciation to the president for important learning moments I took with me from the experience of working with him, which include lessons the way I interpreted them. Something like he taught me that whenever you are in church, set the bar high and dare to dare. He never said it, but I think he said it. <laughs> I also learned from him that you must always support members of your team, especially if they get into trouble for doing the right thing, because he did it to us. This is a lesson that, lessons that I cherish. There's never, it's never too late to do an exit interview. <laughs> Looking back, <laughs> Looking back, I can summarize my experience in government as having been an opportunity to work for an institution I was proud of, which is our government, bosses I respected, both Madiba and President Mbegi, and doing a job that I loved. And it really felt good to be an African. So I have to say, if you haven't had the experience of working for an institution you respect, you, you, you are proud of, a, a boss you respect, and doing a job that you love, Sorry, <laughs> I had that opportunity. Today, it is Africa Day. Today, it is also a special day for those people who believe in Africa. On this day, the Africa Day of 2018, we are discussing a subject of gender equality and women's empowerment, and how it intersects with the, our quest for development and poverty eradication, and the paradigm that we need to create for that to happen effectively. I think the topic uh, correctly suggests that we reconsider the paradigm within which we conduct our work of advancing gender equality and development in order to eradicate poverty. But allow me to first also pay a tribute to Mama Albertina Sisulu as we celebrate her life that was lived with purpose for a purpose in the face of tremendous adversities the purpose never changed. Her dignified leadership continues to inspire us, and her advocacy for the emancipation of women will never be forgotten. Malibongwe. Allow me to also to recognize some wonderful young Africans, people who inspire us. I want to recognize in absentia a young sister to me, who's my boss, Amina Mohammed of Nigeria, who is the Deputy Secretary General of the UN. I want to give a shout out to Casta Semenya. Yeah. I want to get, give a shout out to Jaha Dukare from the Gambia, who is a survivor of child marriage, as well as FGM, who is now an advocate for other girls, saving them and helping those that are still trying to, to get over the ordeal to heal. That is her version of Me Too. And Jaha is a nominee for the Nobel Peace Prize. I want to give a shout out to my boy, Edin Dopu, 
Where is she sitting? He is here in the room. Eddie is on his wheelchair bound with a condition that is very complicated to explain because it's very scientific. I forget the name. But Eddie has just graduated from Oxford University. He's got a master's, he needs 24-hour care, and he's determined to go to the space. First wheelchair. And he reminds us, and I remind you, that 10% of the people in the world have a disability. It's one of the biggest minorities that we have. So, there are so many people like this in Africa. Whenever we have an opportunity to celebrate them, let us please celebrate them. A day like this, we will buy bees and G and just celebrate them. There is also another young person I just want to celebrate today. Her name is Natalia Wambui of Kenya. She's 10 years old, and she's already authored three books. I'm sure many of you have seen her in the social media. So as we fight for gender equality, we must know that there are these people who inspire us. The fight for gender equality and women's empowerment is universal and important for men and women. It's important for all women, no matter where they live. It is important that when we think about changing the paradigm, this includes a universal approach to fighting for gender equality. Across the world, gender inequality affects women, including those who live in societies that are more gender equal, who could be also affluent. They are not insulated from domestic violence, from wage inequality, from being overlooked when a candidate for a head of state is being sought after, when it is time to ordain a bishop, she could have been singing her lung out in the pews every day and all the time whenever she was there. But come time for leadership, she does not feature. So it does not matter where you live and where you are as a woman, the struggle is yours. There is also not denying that the violation of rights of women hits harder on women who live in harsher conditions, such as women who are gripped by poverty, or women who are in societies where crimes against women are tolerated, or located in conflict-affected areas, or in areas where women and girls bear the brunt of the dehumanizing encounters with armed fighters. Our call to women and men is to continue the fight in all countries, because at this point, there is no country that has achieved gender equality. And this means, therefore, all hands on deck. Violence against women is a problem in all countries. Impunity is entrenched. A man can be a serial abuser, even abusing famous people in Hollywood for decades and get away with it. In countries where rights are protected and there's equality before the law, but she will fear losing her income, risk of poverty, and the stigma that comes with it and keeps quiet. That is why the struggle is universal. Under representation of women in decision making, decision making bodies, from parliaments to media houses to boards of corporation, 
is a global problem. Whether you are in Sweden, in DRC, in South Africa, in India, we are all still fighting to win on this front. Overrepresentation of women amongst the ranks of the poor and in low paying job is a problem in all countries. Wage inequality is a problem in all countries. From Iceland, which is a country that has the highest indicators for gender equality to Yemen. As we speak, the Prime Minister of Iceland, who is a he for she, part of a movement of men who stand for gender equality, has adopted the fight for equal pay as his fight because he accepts that there is a problem in this country. Carrying most of the burden of unpaid care and taking care of children, sick and older relatives at the expense of remunerated activities is a terrain of women in all countries. The ILO calls this the motherhood penalty because in many cases, in the fullness of a woman's life, she would have lost 40% of her income because of motherhood related activities. Because in the world, less than 10%, 30% of women live in countries where there is adequate and fully paid leave. And I think in South Africa, we must congratulate ourselves because we don't look bad there. But many women will allow themselves even to be overlooked when they feel that they have too much to do at home. Sacrifice promotion, not be allocated shares that come with a certain level of performance and therefore render themselves uncompetitive at the workplace, notwithstanding that they are competent. In some countries, when a woman has a child and she has to take time off, she loses part of her remuneration. That is why the ILO calls it the motherhood penalty. But when a man has a child, she gets additional income, and that is called the fatherhood reward. Really? And of course, whenever there's a, a, a battle about maintenance, it is not the men who are standing in a line at the maintenance court because the mom has run away with the bread. So you reward the men and you penalize the woman. What kind of a world is this? The paradigm has to change. Everywhere in the world also, women are affected by discriminating stereotypes and norms, even in countries that have good laws. The good laws are not as effective as they can be because of the underlying stereotypes that the laws were supposed to fix. We are a victim of that in South Africa. We have got good laws, but we don't fully benefit for the laws that we have in South Africa. Of course, implementation may also be an issue, but the norms in our society are usually stronger than the legislation in the statutes. But also, there are 150 countries in the world still which have a law or two, a bylaw, that blatantly discriminates against women. All over the world, not enough men have been mobilized to become gender activists, change makers who can lead from within and dismantle patriarchy. If this was a class struggle, I would say you are asking men to commit a class suicide. But that would be effective if men are the ones that are actually leading the dismantling of patriarchy. 
We also have not been able, and there I blame also feminists of my generation, because we did not pay enough attention to the mobilization of men as partners in the struggle for gender equality. So we have not been able to mobilize men to create a movement in which men feature strongly for gender equality where they project positive masculinity and fight and defeat the dominant toxic masculinity which expects a man to beat up somebody in order to look strong. Nyabaz uh, Labantu who will say, hey, Anne has got a nice, or maybe because it's usually guys, Tamba has got a nice head. See, I got them I'm shy. That's toxic masculinity. So what I've just described is what we are fighting for when we are talking about changing the overall paradigm. The many things that we do, the initiatives that we have that are fighting gender equality will never give us the results that we want, not unless the overarching ecosystem also changes. It is not about fixing the women. Fix the system. Change the paradigm. Today we celebrate Africa Day. The scorecard for Africa and gender equality is mixed just like you would find in other parts of the world. Because the challenges are considerable, but what is encouraging is that the determination to win is also considerable. So there is no way we can give up. Women and men of all ages are increasingly mobilizing, are mobilized in order to make sure that they will rise up to the needs of this continent. The AU has been a positive force for gender equality. Even when it has not been able to act on the commitment, it has used its stature, its convening power to support initiatives that come with young people, with governments, ourselves as the United Nations, and different institutions. It has also been able to mobilize governments to work together, in particular, to pass and adopt legislation that advances gender equality. African women are also taking steps towards building their own movement and strengthening the movements and the organizations they have, in part to ensure that the fight for development and the fight against, and the, and the fight against poverty is also about changing power relations. Because we are not fighting for development and power that will make us subservient. The la in the few months, in, I mean, in the last month, we convened in Addis Ababa to inaugurate the African Women Leaders Network, a network that we intend to roll out in the 54 countries in Africa. We now have focal points in 34 countries, and we hope to create chapters in every country that will be in touch with the issues and the dynamics of that country, but also be linked in a coordinated way with issues that affect all of us as a continent. The African Women, the African women Leaders Network also in, encourage women to run for office, and we will actively protect women who are considering to run for office, who are in office, from some of the violence that is increasingly being reported that women experience when they are in office, 
the intimidation that will make a woman resign and someone else takes over her constituency. Because it is a sad day when women will not think of going to politics because me nangam shy. This is the broader paradigm in society that cannot exist. We are also, as the African Women's Leaders Network, focused on women peace and security, ensuring that women are actively involved in preventing conflict as mediators and peace activists, in protecting peace in their countries, in participating in peace talks, and making sure that at the peace table they are able to present the issues that are important to people. It is important for the belligerents to make peace in a peace table. Women feel strongly it is important that communities reconcile when there has been a war. It is important that infrastructure is rebuilt, that the well is filled with water, that the schools are rebuilt, that the widows are not discriminated against, that inheritance and custody issues are discussed so that when the war is over, the woman doesn't live and walk alone because the, that battle still continues with her because of some of the rights that she has lost as a result of the dynamics of a war. The AU also has entrenched gender equality in its institution, fighting to ensure that we reach parity within the institution of the, of, of, of the AU. This is expected to be something that we can also emulate as member states. But today, I will keep on coming to, to the challenge of forced and early marriage. Just to illustrate the things that really need all of us in this generation, one rather of the things that need all of us in this generation to say, hell no. This is not something that the next generation must experience. We need to fight and win this and other battles in this generation. I am also picking on this because it affects the innocent little girl, the best thing that we have. When we talk about the demographic dividend in Africa, it is that girl that we give up on when she is 12 and her life is over. Because at that time, she signs a contract with poverty. It is, I think, within us, in our different formations, to unite in order to make sure that we change this trajectory. Sub-Saharan Africa has also contributed to the promotion on women's leadership and provided best practice for other countries and for other regions. Fifteen countries in Sub-Saharan Africa have demonstrated that female representation in national parliament can make the needle move faster and far. South Africa is one of those countries. But there's a lot that we've done. <laughs> and you must get back to business. Based on a joint report that UNOM did last year in 2017, a study that we conducted in 99 countries, we found that globally, Women between the ages of 24 and 35, which are the peak years for earning and for reproductive activities, are the poorest in the world in developed and developing countries. Women of this age group are likely to be poorer than their male counterparts. Clearly, the responsibility for reconciling paid work and family responsibilities falls disproportionately on her shoulders with huge consequences for their incomes 
rights, and livelihood. Because then it is where you also surrender to abuse because you don't have plan B. The widening gender gap after the age of 24 also coincides with a time when you actually need resources in order to take care of your life and that of your children. What was disturbing for this study was to see that for sub-Saharan Africa, this starts very early because our children are being married off so early. In some regions where uh, they are able to start a bit late and a bit mature, they actually can assert themselves and get out quickly. When they start early, also chances are that they have not been at school for a long time. So that also works against them. And in many countries, there isn't second chance education. So this is it for many women. We did the study because we wanted to target the most vulnerable age group of women in society and parts of the world. We looked at the countries in Africa where the problem was more complex. It was indeed in those countries where early marriage is rife, even worse when it is also a country in conflict. South Africa also exhibited the same pattern. What was also interesting about South Africa was that we also did a model to look at how we could turn this around using the regulatory framework of South Africa, just by providing universal access uh, to childcare in South Africa, we would turn the situation around dramatically, create more than two million jobs, enhance school readiness for the children, and give back women the choice to go to the labor market. So. This is like tick, 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 tick. This is one of those choices that hopefully will be easy to make. So gender inequality in the labor market alone costs Sub-Saharan Africa about 95 billion US dollars annually between the ages 2010 and 2014 peaking at 105 billion in 2014, according to the UNDP Human Development Index report. These results confirm that Africa is missing its full growth potential because a sizable portion of its growth reserve women is not being fully utilized and supported economically to be productive. And of course, this contributes towards women being disproportionately represented amongst the poor. We have joined hands with the IMF to look at how we can convince ministers of finance to be the one that are leading the change of this paradigm because because you present them with the money, then they understand the cost of discrimination in our countries. We are 102 billion Africans, 600 million women, 200 million are between the ages of 15 and 24, and 10% of the population is disabled. Gender responsive and context specific budget can go a long way towards making sure that all these categories of people are as productive as we need to be. There is also evidence that indicates that our inability to invest in women's enterprises, in this case, farmers, costs us a lot on food security. Evidence indicates that if women farmers had the same access to productive resources as men, they will increase yields on their farms by 20 to 30%, raising total agricultural output 
in their countries by 2.5 to 4 percent. This would reduce the number of hungry people in the world by around 12 to 17 percent. Almost 60 percent of employed women in sub-Saharan Africa actually work in the informal sector. So again, that denies them the opportunity to have sustainable earnings. And because in most of our countries, we don't have social protection policies that address the specific needs of these women and men, many of them are destined to be poor. We have engaged with governments in different parts uh, of the continent about changing social protection policies so that they can be extended to some, to some extent to this constituency, which of course is also difficult to some extent because many governments in Africa do not collect that much tax, so the reserves are not in abundance. However, gender responsive budgeting that has been used in Latin America has been able to help the fiscals even address this constituency. We have also made sure that we engage governments about infrastructure that is needed by people who are in the informal sector. Because overzealous police tend to harass people in the informal sector, take away their goods, which actually are their assets. If you take the box of oranges, it's income for two days or sometimes a week that is gone. For someone who's already down there in terms of levels of poverty. As one of them told me, when you rich people are in trouble because of, a, 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 of, of having a dishonored a, a, a traffic, I mean, a, for, a, for a traffic offense, you get a fine and you go and pay. No one takes your car, they take my oranges. So the poorest of the poor gets the most severe punishment. The paradigm has to change. <laughs> These women sit in the market Many of you would have seen them in Nigeria, in East Africa. They sleep there. They educate children who become judges and professors and presidents. <laughs> they deserve a buffer and a protection. They are actually the ones who are the shock absorbers for the state against poverty. In the same way that girls are the shock absorbers for the state when we fail to deliver infrastructure. A girl with her wobble little feet has to go to the river to get water to quench the thirst of a muscular man sitting at home. And sometimes she's raped, bitten by a snake. It is because a council in Jonte Imali infrastructure, there is no water in the home. A five-year-old has to pay the price. So we really need to look at the, all of these things and connect them so that even when we do, how am I doing for time? <laughs> we must make sure that we are actually removing the systemic barriers that must not recur in the next generation. South Africa, oh, let me just first talk about Ethiopia an interesting country to learn from. So Africa has, in the top 10 fastest growing countries, six of its own. Ghana, Ethiopia, Cote d'Ivoire, Djibouti, Cambodia, Bhutan, Senegal, Tanzania, Philippines, and India are the 10 fastest growing economies in the world, and six are from Africa. Kwaban. This demonstrates the resilience of our countries. Remember, not less than 30 years ago, 
Ethiopia was a postcard of poverty and malnutrition. Think of a country also like Djibouti. I suspect Konabanga Yaze may be in Jongi, except the profess. So we know how to do things. And we can make these changes, but we have to make sure that we are also addressing the situation of women and girls. Because to do so well in these countries and then marry a girl at 12, counterproductive. Thankfully, these governments, we engage with them intensely and um, they are fighting. And thanks to the AU also for supporting their fights to end child marriage. In the case of South Africa, over 17 million South Africans receive social grants. This is more people than the 15 million who are employed. That has to concern us. Though the 15 million of people who are employed did not sound right. But anyway, uchumlu. <laughs> A survey of the impact of social grants indicates that female-headed households that receive grants are three times more productive uh, than the male-headed households. 82% of women grant recipients said the grant made their lives better. 79% said they could now take better care of their children. Nearly all of them who were women surveyed had their children enrolled in school and attending regularly. This is a good story that this investment that we are, we are making is actually making a difference. Even though in the border and the bigger picture, we have to address the issue of this ha -ha -ha, transformation that must change things in such a way that the state does not have to look after so many people. That is why this inequality in South Africa is something that we all have to unite to try and do something about. The fact that in our country, the one top percent of South Africans own 70.9% of South Africa's wealth. The fact that the 60 bottom owns 7% of the wealth of this country means that something radical somewhere has to happen. But something has to change. This is not sustainable. The Sustainable Development Goals, Agenda 2063, and our INDP, these are the things we want to change. We need to work together so that we do them in a manner that is in the best interest of the country. The fact that land ownership pattern is the way it is in our country, is a concern, and we should not make it worse. We have to find a solution for it. But what, to, what, what would be radical about this is if, as a result of it, women's poverty was wiped off. That should be the, t the terms of reference. So women need to put forward the terms of reference. What does success look like? Because what would be radical is really if the women who are at the bottom of the pyramid suddenly became people who appeared everywhere in the strata of society in healthy doses. So the path that we take, therefore, must lead us to that. Uh, I just want to quickly touch on something that is important. You know, that was supposed to be my really main topic. For me. The free trade area. The fact that uh, we have come this far in Africa, that on the 21st of March in Kigali, 44 African Union members signed the agreement establishing the African continental free trade area is something to celebrate. The free trade era is crucial because it takes us towards a step that will address the fragmented economic African market, which is detrimental to 
Africa's growth part and to women's true economic empowerment. Overarching infrastructure, overarching economic policies needs to be in place for women's economic empowerment so that when we do the small things, the overarching policy framework is working in our favor. Africa with its 1,2 billion people and 54 countries is divided by at least, at least 100 borders. That is a factor in the exchange of goods and services and movement of people. It is paperwork, it is tariff, it is constraints. By the time you finish trading, you have paid so much just for moving around. India has 1,3 billion people, a unified market, no borders to cross, and therefore provides a better and enabling environment for the transfer and the exchange of goods and services. Our competitiveness is therefore compromised in the manner in which we are. But of course, this is not going to be a magic wand. We have to work in order to make sure that it is successful. Women who trade across borders account for nearly 70% of the women, mostly in the informal sector. They are particularly vulnerable from harassment, violence, confiscation of their goods, and even imprisonment. But when we implement, we must make sure that these things will go away. Because it is not automatic that they will go away if we do not pay attention. South-South Cooperation also has a possibility to be strengthened as a result of this agreement. I want to finish by highlighting two things. Firstly, the issue of violence against women in the world and in our country. The most dehumanizing form of discrimination against women. Deadly. It occurs also in every country, in every class, in every race. We have reached a point, as far as this issue is concerned, where we actually need to come together for what I sometimes call a truth and an action in Daba. Women who suffer violence in the majority do not report. They are the walking wounded. We estimate that at least a billion women in the world live with violence of one sort or the other. We know this because WHO, our partner, when we gather the data for this work, participates actively. They gather their data from orthopedic surgeons, from mental health institutions, from eye specialists, from ENT, from the morgues, because this is the result of violence against women. The prevalence is so high, the impunity is so entrenched that when a handful of men in Hollywood gets arrested, people say, I know man, you are shy, man, you are my daughter. More than a billion women living in violence, a handful of men in one hand, then this is a crisis. Of course, we want due process. We do not want any way to trivialize this issue so that men are accused wrongly. But the prevalence and the impact this has on society is such that time is up. Something significant has to do. We come together, Magiwe Pansi Gomtunzi, Sishil. And Omama Nodata Beli Kaya, Etuai Africa, Oktua in the world, we need to think about how we're going to change this. Because as policymakers, can you imagine if every woman who has a reason to report did report and there was justice? Countries would fall because of the prevalence. 
and where it happens, and the fact that it is usually people who have power who use this power over other people. And therefore, in, if justice was carried, it would mean that many of the people who have power would have to pay the price and there would be consequences. So, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not asking for a truth on reconciliation between perpetrators and abuse, but I'm asking for something to begin to happen so that we can try to address these issues and find a way of turning around the way society is and how this has been normalized. We need a men's movement, people. We need a men's movement. We cannot allow society and the next generation to experience this. South Africa is bidding for a seat in the Security Council. There will be a vote on the 6th of June. I think we will win, but we'll be going there in the most divided, the most challenging situation ever. I remember when we were there, the last two times, we were able to make an impact. We were strong, we were respected in the world, we could punch above our weight, go <laughs> you know? And the environment is not enabling. I hope that we will support our government in this very important task. My wish that, of course, we carry Africa's agenda, as the president also said in his speech this morning, but also that we use the opportunity to address the value system that underpins the multilateral system that is now being questioned and is in a crisis. We, I also hope that we'll be able to use this opportunity to address some of the emerging issues in the peace and security at arena. For instance, the engagement with non-state armed forces who now dominate the wars that are protected, that are fought out there. And in those wars, there is no Rome statute to go to. If you are confronted with a situation as a victim of the abuse of these extremists, in Dabayaku. But the world has to do something about this. We have sexual violence used as a tactic of terrorism. We have acute vulnerability of refugees and IDPs. We have returning um, uh, ex-fighters ex, ex, uh, who crime we don't quite know about because we don't quite know what happened where, where, where they were, but they could also present a threat and a risk to, the, to their own countries and you cannot keep them away from their own country and you cannot arrest them for a crime you don't know about. I know a bit about this because my son Leo is doing research on it, so he tells, talks to me about it every day. But it is a serious problem. We also need to be concerned about sexual violence against men and boys, which is resurfacing significantly, and children born of wartime rape. This is the Security Council we are getting into. We must stand for this value system. We must fight for these people who are victims, underdogs, survivors, because as South Africa, we are better than that. Thank you. Wasn't that profound? <laughs> Dr. Mlambo, we need you on stage. Dr. Mlambo Nuka, we need you on stage. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I think today and tonight we can coin hashtag diary of a phenomenal woman. Without further ado, let's welcome our panel facilitator, Ms. Lerato Mbele Roberts. She needs no introduction, we know her. Our other panel members, distinguished panel members, we have our doctor, Jessica Kabila, and our own UNISA professor, Kopano Ratele, with our own first and one and only former Deputy President, Dr. Mlamon Muka. Okay, thank you very much for that. Thank you, Sis Daisy. Thank you very much for a comprehensive um, presentation on the state of gender equality and women's empowerment in Africa. And also thank you for the levity with which you delivered your lecture because these are hard and complex issues. And at times they're heavy on our heart and they weigh heavily on our heart. So thank you for the lighter moments where you can just see something and give us something to laugh about in the midst of... Um... Well, um, the panel discussion will be continuing and if you want to continue to listen in or watch in on uh, that debate that will be taking place, we are streaming it live on our YouTube channel. That is the SABC News YouTube channel. I think um, SAFM is also carrying um, that uh, debate, the panel discussion live. Um, on SAFM, so you can catch that debate live on SAFM as well as the SABC News Channel. But quite interesting um, aspects that uh, Pumzile Mlambongnuka have touched on quite specifically, the issue around uh, violence against women. She said about one billion women walk around, quote unquote, the walking, the walking wounded, um, who do not report the crimes against violence, the, the crimes of violence that um, have been perpetrated against them. And she said that um, even men should come out and there should be a men's movement um, to ensure that um, our girls, to ensure that our women um, feel protected in the world. But um, something else that she touched on was the issue around um, forced marriages as well as um, young girls being married off at a very young age. Um, but I personally think that this was a missed opportunity for the UN Women's um, Head um, speaking on the issue of um, Nora Hussein in uh, Sudan. This was a missed opportunity that she could have spoken about, um, uh, that she could have spoken about Nora Hussein, 19 years old at the age of 16 she was forced to get married and of course as we know right now she's facing the death penalty in Sudan um, we understand that she is appealing um, that death penalty sentence that has that has been handed out the United Nations has come out and said that um, they are pleading for leniency however though um, Pumzile Mnambunuka could have done that year today as well considering the number of people who are following this debate that is happening here and this discussion that is happening here live around um, the state of women in the country and the state of women um, across the world. She also spoke about the Security Council. As you know, that South Africa is bidding for a non-permanent seat on the Security Council. That elections will be taking place um, next month. And she says that she believes that um, South Africa would win a seat. However, it will be a difficult and challenging time for the country considering the state in which the world finds itself now. And um, as we normally say in social media, shade has been thrown and certainly shade being thrown against um, the, or rather against the President of the United States, uh, Donald Trump, as many has been arguing that uh, multinationalism is under the attack, it, multinationalism is being challenged as it stands at the moment. She also spoke about um, sexual violence as, um, as a tactic of terrorism, as you know that various countries face um, conflicts that are currently taking place. Place. And who takes care of those uh, women and children who are raped during these conflicts that take place? And the children who are birthed from these rapes that are taking place? Um, the end of um, this program, of course, as we've indicated that the panel discussion is continuing and you can watch that panel discussion on our YouTube channel and also follow it on SAFM. Right now, let's go straight back to you guys in studio. <laughs>